Summary of Orlando by Virginia Woolf Orlando is using the sword to attack at the pagan head of a moor that is hanging from the ceiling of his father's huge English house. Someone Orlando's father or grandpa may have killed someone while riding in the barbarous fields of Africa, and Orlando is eager to do the same. But right now he is only 16 years old and way too late to meet the queen. Orlando quickly changes clothes when a loud whistle signals that Queen Elizabeth I has arrived. Just in time, the queen's nervous, crabbed, and sickly hands are ready to accept his bowl of rose water as he runs to the front of the line. Queen Elizabeth loves the top of Orlando's head and thinks he is the very image of a noble gentleman. Orlando never looks up. Following two years, the queen invites Orlando to her court at Whitehall and names him treasurer and steward. Orlando has a great life with lots of beautiful women who love him, but his first love is poems. He writes a lot of very long and abstract prose and poems, and he has the wildest, most absurd, extravagant ideas about poets and poetry. Lady Margaret, or Euphrosyne as she is called in his sonnets, is soon to marry Orlando, but he falls in love with Sasha, a Muscovite princess, right away. They meet at the Fair of the Great Frost. They plan to run away together, but Orlando sees Sasha on the Russian ambassador's ship as it moves out to sea when he goes to meet her just as the Thames River starts to melt. Orlando is crushed by Sasha's lie, and he is a total shame at court because he didn't try to hide his feelings for Sasha from Euphrosyne. Orlando is sad and depressed, so he doesn't wake up at his normal time on June 18, 2016, and sleeps for a week without any sign of life. As usual, Orlando wakes up on the seventh day with an imperfect recollection of his past life. Several doctors check him out and suggest different treatments, such as rest and not eating. Ultimately, all of them agree that Orlando has been asleep for a week. The person telling the story knows that Orlando's story is very unlikely to be true, but it is their job to state the facts as far as they are known and let the reader decide what to think of them. As Orlando's depression and fear of death get worse, he turns to writing as a way to feel better. He works on the poem The Oak Tree, which he has been working on for years. Also, he writes to a friend who knows a lot of writers and asks that friend to call Nicholas Green, a very famous writer, to Orlando's house for a visit. Green says yes, and over dinner he tells Orlando that poetry in England is dead. In his book, Glore, Green says that Shakespeare and Marlowe only write for money and don't have any divine ambition. According to Green, the Greeks were great, not the Elizabethans. Green writes a sarcastic roast of Orlando after his meeting with him. In it, he criticizes Orlando's original play, The Death of Hercules, calling it wordy and bombastic in the extreme. After being hurt again, Orlando goes back to the oak tree for support and later meets the Archduchess Harriet Griselda. That being said, Orlando knows that his feelings for the Archduchess are lust the vulture, not love, the bird of paradise, so he asks King Charles to send him to Constantinople as an ambassador. As an ambassador, Orlando does his job in Constantinople with admiration, and he is even given a dukedom. A great fire happened during the revolution, though, the narrator says, and most government papers were destroyed. We have tried our best to make a rough outline from the burned pieces that are left, the narrator says, but there have been times when we had to guess, speculate, and even use our imagination. It is said that some kind of miracle will happen at Orlando's extravagant ball on the day that Sir Adrian Scrope gives Orlando's patent of nobility. People start to riot when Orlando accepts his patent and dukedom, but no miracle happens. Sir Adrian and a squad of British bluejackets have to stop them. Someone is seen hugging a woman of the peasant class on Orlando's porch later that night. The next morning, Orlando again doesn't wake up at his normal time. Orlando is taken to the doctors and checked out. His room is pretty messy, and there are a lot of papers lying around. Some are poems about oak trees, and others are marriage certificates for Orlando and a gypsy dancer named Rosita Pepita. Later, he sleeps again for a week. On the seventh day, when he wakes up, Orlando is a woman. Her friend Orlando's change has happened so painlessly and completely that it doesn't surprise her at all. 
As the storyteller puts it, Orlando's change of sex changed his future, but it did nothing to change who he was. As soon as Orlando gets dressed, he leaves the house and goes straight to the land of the gypsies. Later, they don't have any ink or paper, so Orlando leaves to go back to England. Orlando starts to understand the penalties and the privileges of her position on the ship to England. She is mostly the same girl she has always been, but wearing a petticoat has made a big difference. For Orlando, being a woman is the most tedious discipline and she has to dress, look, and smell perfect all the time. Orlando isn't usually this way, and it takes her several hours of work to change. Orlando keeps working on her song The Oak Tree, and she becomes more involved with London life. Orlando meets the famous 18th century author Alexander Pope at Lady R's party, her drawing room is said to be where all intelligence and talent come from. She asks Pope to come home with her. After he does that, Orlando's house becomes a popular spot for famous writers to get together. Orlando chooses to write down all the funny things they say in a book, but it stays empty while she works on her song in silence. Orlando will not know when the 18th century ends and the 19th century starts. As the century ends, a new queen and weather come into being. There is a dampness in England. Orlando doesn't agree with the new age at all, and he can't write. Her body starts to tingle and vibrate in the second finger of her left hand, and Orlando decides that she has to get married in the spirit of the age in order to finish her poem. When Orlando goes for a walk in the park, she trips and breaks her ankle. That's when she meets Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmerdine. In minutes, Orlando and Shell are engaged. The next day, Shell looks at Orlando all of a sudden. You are a man, Orlando. Shell screams. Shelly, you're a woman. Orlando answers back. While they are getting married on Orlando's estate, no one hears the word obey said before the rings are passed. While Shell is away sailing around Cape Horn, Orlando is left to finish the oak tree. After all, she's been writing it for more than 300 years. Done. Before leaving the poem for good, Orlando yells. She knows it has to be read, so she goes to London right away. Nick Green, who Orlando meets in the city, is now the most influential critic of the Victorian age. Before Green talks about how bad English verse is, Shakespeare and Marlowe, those were the giants, it seems like Orlando's dress opens up, and the oak tree falls from her chest. The poem is read right away by Green, who says it reminds him of the great Elizabethans and says it needs to be released. When Orlando and Green say goodbye, Orlando quickly sends a message to Shell to tell him how great her poem is, and she then walks into a shop. She gets some of Green's important works and tells the seller to send her everything important. Then she starts to read. She finds out that reviewers want writers to always write like someone else and that all of Victorian writing can be written out in 60 volumes octavo or squeezed into six lines the length of this one. Orlando stares out the window for a long time after coming to this decision. On March 20th, at 3 o'clock in the morning, the nurse gives Orlando a baby. Ma'am, it's a very good boy, the nurse says. The boy Orlando is back at the window. Buffer up, reader, the narrator says, nothing similar is going to happen today, it's not even the same day. It's changing outside. The flip of a switch lets a lot of light into a house, and water gets hot in seconds. One of the clocks nearby goes off. As of 10 a.m. on October 11th, 1928, it is the present moment. Orlando stops and kisses her. Terrifying revelation doesn't get any scarier than the announcer saying this. Orlando starts driving in her car. Her list of things to buy is with her when she goes shopping in town, but she forgets most of them. This is what middle age is like, Orlando says. What a strange thing. After driving for a while, she gets out of the car at a house and farm. Are you talking about Orlando? When Orlando screams, Orlando? Opal gets back in her car and goes home when no one answers. As Orlando walks through her huge mansion's empty rooms, she remembers all the parties and people who have been there over the years and feels a sad sense of sadness. 
She leaves the house and goes to the yard, then down a dusty path to an old oak tree. In the oak tree, Orlando puts her poem at the base of the tree and looks up at the sky. She knows that Shell is on board the plane that is flying above her. Sheldon, here you are. Orlando yells higher. While Shell is jumping out of the plane, a single wild bird flies over his head. Yes, it's the goose. Orlando shouts. After the wild goose, the twelfth stroke of midnight hits on Thursday, the 11th of October, 1928. About the author. Wolf was born in South Kensington, London, into a very wealthy family. When Wolf was a child, she had an education at home, during which she was taught mostly Victorian literature. Her mother died of the flu in 1895, and her half-sister Stella died the next year. Wolf went to King's College London to study literature and history. In 1900, she started writing seriously. Wolf's father died in 1905, and she and her brothers moved to Bloomsbury, a London neighborhood known for its schools and cultural centers. Wolf lived in Bloomsbury with her friends, who included friends of her brothers from Cambridge. These friends were top writers, artists, and thinkers, and they became known as the Bloomsbury Group. The people in the Bloomsbury Group really liked all kinds of art, and they strongly disagreed with their parents' strict Victorian views and norms. E.M. Forster, Roger Fry, and Lytton Strachey were all part of the Bloomsbury Group, which is also where Wolf met Leonard, the man she would marry. They got married in 1912, and Wolf's first book, The Voyage Out, came out in 1915. Leonard and Virginia Woolf started the publishing house Hogarth Press in London together in 1917. However, Woolf's next book, Mrs. Dalloway, didn't come out until 1925. After the death of her mother, Woolf had a lot of mental health problems, including serious sadness and anxiety. Woolf was hospitalized several times during her life and tried to kill herself twice. Woolf's doctors told her that reading and writing would make her situation worse, and they often told her to alternate between resting and working out. In 1922, Wolf met Harold Nicholson and his wife, Vita Sackville-West. Both Nicholson and Sackville-West were successful writers, and the two fell in love. Their relationship lasted most of the 1920s. Their relationship changed into a close friendship in the early 1930s, but Sackville-West was still a very important person in Wolf's life. Then, Sackville West, a famous author, started putting out her books through the Hogarth Press. This is said to have kept the business from going bankrupt, and she told Wolf to keep working even though her doctors told her not to. Wolf did right. To the Lighthouse came out in 1927, and Orlando, a creative biography and kind of love letter to Sackville West, came out in 1928. Wolf is also known for being a powerful reviewer and writer. Her 1929 book A Room of One's Own is one of her most well-known works. Wolf's Suicide at the Age of 59 Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.